God is actually, like I said, sovereign over the waters. We see this in Genesis. We see this in Exodus with God, where God was dividing the Red Sea. We see this when uh, God is uh, defeating Leviathan, a sea uh, serpent. We see this basically throughout the Bible that waters are not something that is, uh, it may be untamable by someone like me and you, but is completely in control uh, under under Yahweh, but not just that, it serves his purposes for good and for evil. Whatever he plans to do with his creation, he's more than um, able to do. Um, but also, oh, this is amazing. Jesus being God. Now, I know we are going to the New Testament just for a time being. We see in Mark 4 and in Mark, in Mark 6 uh, how Jesus comes and he's now subduing nature because he's God, right? He's Yahweh in flesh. He's walking among the people. They're like, who is this dude, right? He, with all this authority, he's like walking and, 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 and subduing these gods of nature, gods of seas, gods of, uh, you know, winds. And like, you know, all these ancient deities, supposedly that others pray to, they had to cut their own flesh so they can, Call upon these gods, so these gods would supposedly pay attention to Jesus. Doesn't do any of these things. He's actually walking towards his uh, his disciples, trying not to, um, you know, bring anxiety among them. But they're like, "Oh, this is this is ghost. Who is this person that is doing these things?" Right. So we see, like I said, in um, in the Gospel of Mark, Mark four and more, Mark uh, six, how uh, Jesus first calms the sea and then he walks on water. If this is not a prime example in the New Testament of Jesus' authority as Yahweh in flesh over uh, these chaotic, I won't say beings, but these chaotic forces slash fallen beings who thought they have some authority over these, um, you know, parts of nature or life. I don't know if we can find better uh, examples. So these bring so much delight knowing and, uh, and uh, confidently knowing like, hey, this is the dude whom I serve. This is my Lord and Savior. So can we please just, um, you know, expand on these passages from, from Mark 4 and 6? Yeah, I love it. I mean, it's amazing. Like, so, you know, you, you say we'd, we're not personifying those things, but the people would have seen the connections. They would have connected them intimately. There, there were beings who had supposedly authority over those things. And Jesus is just out there, just walking all over it like it's nothing. And, and it, again, it's not, he didn't have to take a sword and go and fight the waves. He just walked out there because he could. There, there's no battle there. There's no struggle there. But people would have known that that's what he is doing, is showing his authority there. And, yeah, so, you know, I, I remember when I was little, we would hear the story of Jesus walking on water. And it's, it's this idea, you know, to me it was like, oh, look, this is a miracle. I can't walk on God, water. Jesus can walk on water. So that's the difference that was the difference in my mind, right? It, it was showing that there was a miracle. Why it was water and why he had to walk on it, I had no idea. Like, I didn't have any of those associations with chaos in my mind when I was younger. Like, I had no idea that the original authors would have thought, ah, look at Jesus being a, the authority over these other uh, fallen gods. And once I see that, I go, oh, it's not just another miracle. It, it was an indication of his deity. So it, it's not that, you know, he just some parlor trick. Like, it was so much more than that. And the depth of meaning there is just incredible once you look at it and once you start seeing these. And the, I guess that's why, that's one reason I really like biblical studies is you get to know these things that you've maybe read dozens of times and you've heard the story a dozen times, but looking at it with that slightly new nuance, you go, oh, 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 I see. And it's just so cool. 
I didn't think about asking this question, but it just comes to my mind. So I have to ask, do you think that in the same fashion as uh, in Christ, uh, God gives us authority over uh, demons, which are called scorpions and snakes, metaphorically elsewhere? Do you think that in, in that fashion, when Peter said, when Peter is asking Jesus to give him basically authority to walk upon the waters, do you think that uh, maybe you're trying? Maybe I'm trying to see what is not there. But do you think spiritually looking behind just what was happening on the in the natural realm? Do you think spiritually, in a way, Jesus was bestowing his authority on Peter to walk upon? Um, these fall deities and gods which were uh, trying to tame the nature, but then Jesus came and showed them who is the big boss. And then look, not just he's the big boss, but he's giving one of his, I won't, I won't say minions, but one of his disciples can actually also defeat these gods. Do you think there is this spiritual warfare in, this, in that little part of the story where Peter tries to walk on the water? Definitely. I think we see that and of course, you know, Peter gets afraid and, well, what does that mean? And we, we look at Peter's life and he has all of these ups and downs, right? Like he's he's riding really high and he's doing real well. And then suddenly we're like, come on, Peter, really? What? Why did you have to be like that? Or So he's got this up and down kind of progression to his storyline in the New Testament, which is fascinating because... You know, you'd think that Peter, we think of him as being the, one of the closest people to Jesus. And if anybody could have done and should have done and would have known and could have known, it would have been Peter. And yet we see him failing all the time. And yet every single time, what happens? God reaches out and lifts Peter up, even in spite of all of that. So I think that there's this idea of the authority for sure. I think there's the the theme of Peter's uh, just life trajectory that we could see. And we can also see ourselves in that as well, because if, if I mean, not that we are all just like Peter and not that we are, are you know, but there's, there's the idea that we are also given authority because we're in Christ. And so what are we going to do with that? Are we going to trust God? Are we going to keep our eyes on him and keep walking forward? Are we going to get afraid? And you know what? Even if we do, which we will, we, we fail. We're going to get afraid. We're going to not trust God like we should. But God still reaches out and God's still getting his, his missions and things accomplished. It just, it's this progression of, of learning and discipleship that we are all on. If Peter had to be on a path of discipleship, then what about us? We don't walk daily with Jesus physically present next to us. You know, we're not eating fish with him daily, but we go into our churches and, and we ha we partake of the Lord's Supper, and that's part of eating with Jesus. So, you know, it, I think that when we see these things, then we can really say, what does that mean for the life of the disciple? And how can I be a better disciple looking at these stories like, I think that's a pretty cool thing to be bringing out.